Hi guys, welcome to today's video. For those of you that know me, welcome back. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Dr. Elise Tercy and I'm a functional medicine provider here in the state of New York. And today I want to bring to you or bring awareness to a topic that is really under talked about, but I do think needs to be coming out of the woodwork because it's really, really prevalent in terms of the symptoms it causes. And that is chronic fatigue syndrome induced by viral load. So today we're gonna to talk about a specific virus, which is the Epstein-Barr virus, and the way it works, kind of the mechanism of action or what's called the pathophysiology of how it steals our energy because unfortunately, when we're dealing with chronic fatigue or low energy, the recommendations are, are not the best and often don't yield results that people find valuable. So I wanna share with you things that I see in clinical practice that are, are causing low energy, that chronic fatigue syndrome, and then also maybe some things that we can do to A, identify if this is happening for you, and then also address next steps in terms of how do we support this. Stay tuned if you're interested to learn more. What is Epstein-Barr virus? I know that you guys know this, but you might not know the name of it um, in the viral name, so to speak, but Epstein-Barr virus, it's the virus that causes mono mono for mononucleosis or the kissing disease. A lot of us end up getting this when we're in, in our adolescent kind of years in high school or maybe even in college. What ends up happening is often we don't even know that we're infected by it. It can mimic or look just like strep throat or sometimes no symptoms even arise at all. Now, I hate to reference this, but I just think it's an important kind of comparison that right now we are in a global pandemic with the coronavirus. And what we're learning is that viruses cause damage, viruses cause metabolic distress internally, and viruses can even cause death. We also are learning that viruses might not have symptoms. And so I think that that concept can be used in this conversation because we have to remember that not not all symptoms will show up when we're infected with viral load. So often people say when I'm uh, doing a, a workup in clinical practice, no, I never had mono. No, I never had Epstein-Barr virus. Little do they know in their blood work that they do have antibodies or an old activation of the virus. So that means that their immune system has definitely seen it. They've been exposed, but they just might not have known because not every virus causes symptoms. However, sometimes we do experience a lot of symptoms. So EBV herpes 4, it's in the herpes family, and it is something that's very, very, very common. We all pick it up, we all share it, but the way that we deal with the virus and the way our immune system mounts this entire response is different for everybody based, based on so many factors. And I wanna talk about the people that are dealing with chronic fatigue um, because that's really the major problem with this is that it's not a big deal in and of itself. We're exposed to a virus and under normal circumstances or in theory, our body should be able to make antibodies and then keep the virus quiet. Because it's a virus, it's always in us. There is no treatment for any viruses. There's, there really just isn't. Um, the best thing that we can do is expose someone to the virus and allow their immune system to make a memory so that if they're infected again, they can remember it. But there is no actual treatment for viruses, but that doesn't mean that we do nothing about it because the symptoms of viral infection can often go under the radar, meaning they're not really looked at from um, kind of an in-depth approach and people can spend their entire lives struggling with low energy, struggling with feeling fatigued always. Um, and it's something that we should, should look at and consider because the viruses can always reactivate, meaning that we get exposed, maybe we know, maybe we don't know. And then all of a sudden our immune system starts to undergo some serious changes that we may or may not feel. And I wanna share with you some of those changes and kind of the nature of the virus. What should happen when we're exposed to a virus? What really should happen to our immune system is we get exposed to something and our body says, wait a second, I don't recognize you. And we send different cells to the virus to basically say, uh-oh, you're an invader. And then we create an immune response or we create um, a cellular response for our body to say, you're a foreign invader. We remember that you're here. We don't really know much about you, but we're gonna flag you as problematic. 
And of course, we get some general symptoms. So typically with viral load, depending on the virus, the symptoms are more general, meaning we get a headache, we might feel chronically uh, low energy, our appetite might not be there, we feel lethargic. All of those are, are symptoms that can happen in a more general uh, capacity. But after the virus has been dealt with in our, in our body and in our blood, those symptoms should subside. That's, that's the way it should work. Unfortunately, that's not the way it always works because the nature of these viruses is they can turn on genes or change our genetic expression. So what ends up happening, which creates the long-term effects is that we're exposed to the virus and the nature of this virus in particular, EBV, now there's many viruses, CMV, there's all different types of viruses, there's different subtype of viruses, there's different variations of them because they mutate. There's so many different uh, viruses out there. Some of them we know about, some of them we don't know about. They're new or they're transitioning, but in particular, this video is about EB, EBV, so I wanna keep it uh, kind of structured to that. Now, EBV, the nature of it is it goes into our powerhouse of our cell and it actually steals our energy, which makes it very problematic because the, the viruses get into our body and they cause mitochondrial dysfunction where they're literally stealing our ATP or our energy. So our cells, they produce energy balls. Think of them like little balloons and says, this is an energy ball, this is an energy ball. And all of those, all of those energy balls have jobs and they go to different places to make us feel energized. Well, with Epstein-Barr virus, it changes the way we're able to produce and use energy at the cellular level. And the problem arises is that when we're exposed to any virus, EBV in particular, we mount both a humoral and a cellular immune response. So it's an entire mass activation, a mass inflammatory storm to our immune system. And because the viruses are using us and our machinery, they like to steal our cells, they like to mutate our genes, they like to change our genetics, and they like to hide out. Epstein-Barr virus is considered a stealth infection, which means that it's very difficult to identify where in the tissues is the virus. Is it systemic? Is it living in the liver? Is it hiding out in the thyroid? One thing I do want to bring to the attention is that it loves the thyroid. Epstein-Barr virus has been linked to create Hashimoto's thyroiditis. That's just something that it does do. It seeds the thyroid is the medical term for it. And through what's called molecular mimicry, it mimics a specific type of cell. And then what happens is our body starts to mount an immune response to the EBV that's now living in the thyroid. Our bodies end up mistaking that, oh, we're attacking the EBV. They end up saying, oh, we're attacking the thyroid. It's just that the EBV now lives in the thyroid. So it can develop into autoimmune conditions and even cancers, viruses are linked to cancers. This specific virus, EBV has been linked to lymphomas um, and different types of immune, dis immune dysregulation. So normally under normal circumstances, I know I'm going off on a tangent, is that our body says, I see you, you are a foreign invader, I'm gonna remember you, I'm gonna make something to deal with you. Under uh, viral loads that are super stealth or super tricky is they say, uh-uh, I'm going to change my shape. I'm going to change where I hide out. I'm going to change where I live and cause problems for you. And the problems arise in something called Pavlov's conditional reflex phenomenon where the antigen or the, the virus is no longer active, but it's underneath the radar, meaning it's a little bit on, like the virus is on, think of it as a stove. Your, your boiler, you're not you know, bubbling with water, but you're bubbling just a little bit. And so what can happen is it's just enough of a, a trigger to activate natural killer cells, to activate B lymphocytes, to activate um, T lymphocytes, and create this long-term inflammatory immune response. And whenever the immune system is on, and whenever the immune system is chronically activated, it's always energetically consuming our cells. So EBV, just to recap, I know we're talking about a lot, through a specific phenomenon, 
it could basically end up causing symptoms even though the body's dealt with the antigen. It's like a delayed immune response where the body's still trying to figure out what happened here. Why can't I figure this out entirely? And that's what's happening. And so the nature of this virus, it's creating um, that chronic fatigue syndrome. And the chronic fatigue syndrome is really, really problematic for a lot of patients, especially when they come to see me, they're exhausted. And this type of virus, I'm not talking about I need a nap on a Saturday after a busy day or a busy weekend. This type of energy, ask anyone that's dealt with this, it's debilitating. It's the kind of fatigue that affects your relationships. It's the kind of fatigue that affects your work environment. It literally steals your energy. And I personally have dealt with this. I've had mono. This was when I was in, how old, how old was I? Uh, probably high school. It was high school actually, because I remember I almost didn't graduate. I missed two months of school. I was wiped out. And I always shared with my family that, and this was before I knew any of this, but I always said I never felt the same. I've never felt the same since. Um, Fast forward to doing some some protocols and some antivirals and some homeopathic tinctures and some enzymes, I feel much better now. But people that have had this, only can you understand it if you've had it because it's the type of energy that literally feels like no matter how much sleep you get, seven, eight, nine hours, you're still exhausted. It's the non-rejuvenating, non-refreshing type of sleep. And that's the number one symptom that we see. And unfortunately, People will say, oh, just take your B vitamin 12, take your B1, your B2, your B5, take a B vitamin, that's good for you. Oh, oh, you need more sleep or, oh, you need to stop exercising as frequently. That's not true. It's just that you have a, a viral infection that's hiding in your tissues that no one's addressing. And this virus loves to create thyroid dysregulation. And the thyroid by default is very metabolically active. It's an organ that's very alive. It's an organ that's very, um, it, it's very active in the sense it's turn, turning over your cells. And so when it creates thyroid dysfunction, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, we end up with hypothyroidism where our thyroid hormones end up dropping low and then everything in our body ends up getting sluggish. We are losing our hair. We're losing our eyebrows. I have a cat next to me. Um, he wants to learn all about EBV. So basically the immune system can go, uh, can go kind of wild and it's, it's not a good thing because it's dual purpose. The fact that it by default steals our energy. And then the other component is that it's starting to create metabolic damage in organs that are also giving us energy. So it's this like vast uh, immune response. And really with a chronic fatigue, um, it's actually known as myalgic encephalomyelitis it's just like this big inflammatory cascade that causes problems. The thing that is the hard part is conventionally they say, well, it's a virus. There's nothing we can do. We can't give you anything for it. Um, and so what could happen is that conventional medicine poo-poos it and says, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Just take extra vitamin C. Well, that's not always the case. And all of my people out there that are, are dealing with this or have dealt with this understand that it's not as simple as just, you know, deal with it. Um, and because it's a virus, it's dormant, it's hiding out. A lot of the herpes viruses, they hide in different areas of the central nervous system. So for example, cold sores. Cold sores are herpes simplex one. They hide out in what's called the dorsal root ganglion of our spinal cord. And so when we get activated, the, the virus travels through the nerves of uh, different branches in our, in our nervous system. And boom, here comes the virus. But this virus, it, lo it loves to go everywhere. So that makes it also more difficult because it's not like, oh, Epstein-Barr -Barr virus is found only in this tissue. It's systemic, it's found in multiple tissues. Okay, so I just want you guys to know that it's a very problematic thing and it can happen and it can create a entire, uh, an entire uh, response for the body and for all of the energy stores. What do we do if we think we've been exposed or we do know we've been exposed but haven't been given options? A, if we think that we might have been exposed, there are definite options because the reactivation of the virus can cause symptoms to kind of crop up and then fall back down and then crop up and then fall back down. So we really wanna make sure that we're not in a reactivation phase. Viruses undergo different mechanics, latency and then dormancy and then reactivation and then quieting down again back into latency and dormancy. So we want to see where we are in the nature of the cycle. And we also want to do some blood testing. There are about four different blood tests 
four different tests that we can do to look at immunoglobulin Gs, immunoglobulin Ms, depending on where you are, is the virus new, is the virus old, and then also what is the the, the tighter load, meaning how much is in the body. Now, a lot of my Epstein-Barr patients, they know this, um, and I, I share this with them, that the titers, meaning the numerical value in the bloodstream, doesn't always go down even though you feel better. So typically what happens is we might get a lab result back with your Epstein-Barr virus results, and there's four values we're looking for, and those could be triple digits, greater than 600, greater than 750 units, depending on which lab you're going to, whether that's Quest or BioReference or LabCorp or Sunrise or uh, Northwell, wherever you're going, we're looking at four values. And triple digits, meaning the numbers are above 20, 29 units, 24.99 units, means that definitely this is a load. This is a significant load to your body. And so we would undergo some uh, antivirals. We'd undergo some, some serious liver cleansing protocols. We would definitely want to ramp up that, that um, cellular detox pathway to make sure that we're getting rid of these stealth infections. And um, basically what happens is these stealth infections, they hide, they change their chemical machinery, they change their nuclear machinery, and they end up looking different. So they're purposely trying to hide from our immune system saying, hey, you shouldn't be here. I see you, you shouldn't be here. And that's what makes them difficult. But the point of the story is that the numbers in the bloodstream don't have to go down in order for us to get better in terms of our symptoms. Yes, we care about labs, but we care about clinically how you're feeling as well. And we don't just read the numbers, we wanna know your symptoms. And often with viral protocols, uh, when we undergo something like that in treatment in clinical practice, people do feel better. The numbers do shift. They definitely can move. For some people, it can take longer than others, but there are things out there. The point of the story is that if you've been dealing with this or if you're not sure, A, get yourself a blood test. I would absolutely encourage working with someone that practices functional medicine um, or even someone that practices more integrative medicine because they're going to be the ones to look at everything in totality from vitamins to minerals to hormones all the good stuff, infection, including bacterial infection, fungal infection, parasites in the gut, all the good stuff. Um, and then also, if you think you've been exposed, you'd want to work with someone that could put you on a heavy dose liver regimen, um, something that's going to help support cleaning up the liver because the liver is both immune and digestive in nature. It's processing fats, it's emulsifying fatty acids, but it's also protecting us from getting uh, bombarded with different types of things. And then of course, there's some natural compounds that work very, very well for supporting viruses to go back into their latency phase. And we don't like viruses to just go haywire and to be left un untreated, if you will, because they can lead to such dysregulation that can create cancer cells or activate oncogenes. And the expression of this particular virus is it changes our entire genetic makeup. It's literally changing genes. Um, they've looked at gene activation and there are specific known genes that have been changed in studies of patients that have been infected versus patients that haven't been infected. A lot of those genes are genes that are governing our energy. So connect yourself with the right person that can definitely support you and make sure that what you're dealing with is being addressed, A, in the appropriate fashion, and then B, if it is something that you're dealing with viral, can be um, supported through some natural antivirals, some tinctures, some homeopathic remedies, some enzymes that can clean, that can repair, and then rebuild your systems. I hope that you guys found this helpful. I am happy to answer some more questions if you have them. Um, I'm trying to put out some, some newer content. So if you happen to have a topic that you'd like to know about, leave it in the comments down below. Otherwise, I will see you guys in my next video. Thanks for watching.